My name is Clement Degea. Uh, I will be moderating this afternoon's uh, panel. Um, so we're going to discuss the future use of blockchain technologies. Uh, so I'll begin here uh, by asking Sandra to introduce herself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to be in Rwanda for the first time. Uh, my name is Sandra Rowe. I'm based in New York, uh, but I travel a lot for blockchain. I wear two different hats these days. I am the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council, GBBC. It's probably a little bit easier to remember. It's a Swiss-based uh, nonprofit focusing on education, advocacy, and partnerships in over 35 countries, growing very quickly, really focusing on helping governments, enterprises, blockchain startups, and regulators build bridges together and get their heads around what the potential of blockchain technology is. And then separately, on the other side, I focus on, um, as an entrepreneur, working on two projects, one based in Cameroon and another one based in Mauritius, focusing on helping rural farmers and bringing price transparency, next generation market infrastructure uh, to physical commodities. Thank you very much, Sandra. Next, we have Riyad Hartani. Uh, good afternoon, um, Riyad Hartani. I'm from Algiers, uh, Algeria, born, grew up there. Uh, spent um, pretty much most of my time the last 15 years or so in Silicon Valley, California, and primarily doing startups, right? So I come mostly from a startup background. Uh, the last two, three years, um, you know, I've been spending a lot of my time in Algiers, and in that context, I'm uh, responsible for the Algiers Smart City Project. And I think today I probably wear more of that hat and discuss blockchain within the smart city project, what we're doing, the applications, and all of that. Uh, the other hat is more global. So uh, yeah, I've done a bunch of startups. Then you know, I co-founded an accelerator in FinTech where we have a lot of blockchain startups in California mainly, uh, an advisory firm doing merger acquisition, an advisory on uh, a number of like, uh, blockchain startups around the world in Asia and, 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 and the far west as well, right? So that's my Thank you. Thank you very much, Riyad. Next, we have Karim Ahrez. Karim, uh, Karim Ahrez, I'm from Tunisia. I will uh, switch in French if you... Uh, uh, je suis un serial entrepreneur, donc j'ai fait plusieurs montages d'entreprises que j'ai revendues, et donc uh, je viens du monde de l'entreprise. Uh, Je préside aujourd'hui euh, le patronat en Tunisie, donc une chambre euh, qui fédère euh, plusieurs start-up et plusieurs start-up dans le monde euh, du numérique, donc euh, beaucoup dans la blockchain. Et euh, voilà, je, vais, je veux participer à, à l'élaboration un peu de cette conception de la blockchain pour euh, construire euh, réellement un environnement en Afrique entre le nord uh, et le sud uh, et toute l'Afrique. Voilà. Yeah, thank you, uh, Karim. Next, we have Michael Kimani. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Kimani. I'm from Nairobi. And today I'm here on two capacities. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm the chairman of the Blockchain Association of Kenya, where we've been building uh, an army of uh, cryptocurrency adopters for the past five years. Um, Today, I'm here as a Vice President Marketing of uh, Chamapesa, which is a blockchain project that's trying to digitize the records of uh, what we call social savings groups in Africa. You might know this in other names, depending on which country you come from. In Kenya, we call them Chamas. I believe in Chad, they are called uh, uh, Pares. In South Africa, they are called Stockvels. So, there are a lot of social savings groups in Africa. In Kenya, we have about 1.2 million groups. They have about $8 billion in assets. But all their records, uh, how much they're saving, how many shares people own in these groups, uh, they're all trapped in manual paper records. So what we want to do as Chamapesa is uh, get these people to start putting their records on, uh, on, uh, on the blockchain, digitize these records, and connect them to the digital financial services narrative that's going on. I'm glad to be here, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Next we have Jimmy Nguyen. Thank you. Um, I actually, hi everyone. Um, I want to thank our moderators for uh, giving me a few moments. I'm sorry. Hello. Um, so, thank you very much. No 
worries. I'll stand here. I want to thank our moderators for giving me a few moments just to talk to you briefly before we get into our panel discussion. We are here to talk about blockchain usage in Africa. And I want to explain why we at our company believe that the blockchain of the future for Africa and the world is Bitcoin Cash and all the things that you can do with it in this world. Here are some of the things I'm sure we're going to talk about on our panel, which are potential uses for blockchain technology, global payments, tokenization, smart contracts, data storage, records registries, IoT, Internet of Things, microtransactions, energy grid solutions, manufacturing, supply chain management, and agriculture solutions. We at Enchain Group believe all of that and more can be done on the Bitcoin Cash Network. And I know we'll talk with our panel about a variety of other ways people are trying to do blockchain solutions. Our belief at Enchain is that it comes down to the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And I'm the CEO of the Enchain Group, which is a global group of businesses dedicated to research and innovation on that topic. And before we get to our panel discussion, I just want to explain to you at least what our vision is, and it may not be everyone else's vision, but it's one that we want to convey to you today, which is that Bitcoin Cash is the true Bitcoin, and it represents the true spirit of the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper published in 2008. Unlike Bitcoin Core, it's got bigger blocks, faster transaction speed, and lower fees. And we believe that can power a blockchain technology solution for everything of the future. If you haven't followed what's happened in Bitcoin over the last few years, this is just a quick summary. The original Bitcoin chain was birthed in 2009. It became slower by freezing its blocks at one megabyte in size rather than increasing it. That led to higher fees, much slower transaction times. So some segments of the Bitcoin community last August got tired of the internal wars and debates in the Bitcoin world and decided to fork off and create the Bitcoin cash chain, which emerged last August with a vision to bigger blocks, faster transaction speed, and a more massively scaled network that we believe evinces the original Satoshi Nakamoto vision. So the basic difference is this. The Bitcoin core chain remains at one megabyte in block size, and you can only fit about 7,000 or so transactions every 10 minutes into that. Whereas the Bitcoin cash chain emerged with an eight megabyte block. And next week, the first major protocol upgrade of Bitcoin cash is happening, where the default block size is being raised to 32 megabytes in size to create throughput capacity for enough data and transactions to support a growing blockchain for all kinds. have a Bitcoin Cash network where the blocks get up to one gigabyte in size, which is a thousand megabytes, powering millions and millions of transactions in those blocks. And our organization with Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, already through a testnet initiative, in that testnet, mine successfully propagated the world's first one gigabyte block last October. And if you want to believe in a bigger future to power enterprise level massive blockchain usage in Africa and beyond, we believe in a day of one terabyte block sizes, which are one million megabytes. And Joannes Vermorel, who's the CEO of a company in France, is the one that birthed this idea. And we're working with his organization on a technical solution called Project Terab to prepare for a network that one day can have blocks of this size, which would mean approximately 4 billion Bitcoin tra cash transactions possible on every block every 10 minutes and 7 million transactions a second meaning for 10 billion humans in the world, the capacity on that network to do 50 transactions per human per day. And because most of us don't do financial transactions of that number every day, it means all of you in this room who are interested in blockchain technology can run all kinds of other data transactions on the Bitcoin Cash network, but only possible on that network. And most critical to all of you is what's the other thing happening with the protocol upgrade happening next week. It's restoring certain operating codes, op codes, that were in the original Bitcoin scripting language long ago, but that the Bitcoin core developers turned off for various reasons we, sh we disagree with. Well, the independent developer groups in Bitcoin Cash have come together, we've worked with them, and starting next week, these opcodes are being restored in the Bitcoin Cash scripting language. What that means is the following. You are able to begin doing things such as tokenization of financial instruments, rewards tokens, colored coins, ICO type tokens on Bitcoin Cash. You're able to start doing things like smart contracts, at least paving the way to them. 
things that today people believe can only be done on the Ethereum blockchain using ERC-20 and other protocols. But we and other members of the Bitcoin Cash community are preparing for the ability for all of you in this room, in Africa and the world, to do all of that on Bitcoin Cash so that it becomes, in our view, the all-in-one coin that can act as a fast global payment system where you can pay for things and you can also do the technical functions of tokenization, smart contracts, and many more advanced capabilities we can't even dream of today. And that is why we believe, when we're talking about what blockchain use can be for Africa and the world, where Bitcoin Cash is really the true solution. Here are examples of things you can do as tokenizing of financial instruments, but it also opens the way to what we believe is an on-demand economy, where things that you would normally buy, let's say like a car, instead of buying a full one like we do in the United States and owning it for years, you're doing it more on demand, not just through the Ubers of the world, but by, through tokenization, maybe buying a fractional interest in one that you get access to only when you need it. It's having goods and services delivered to you through the use of tokens just when you need it on demand. And I think that will change the way ownership happens, which is very powerful for territories like Africa. Because you don't really want the car, you want the ability to travel. And if you can have that through a tokenized system, through fractional interests or the ability to rent the car for periods of time, that's a better way for people to empower themselves. Same thing with the house. It's very expensive to buy a house to afford a down payment, to get a mortgage. But I've already seen ventures approaching us to talk about ability to create tokens to allow people to own fractional interest in real property, to raise money for buying a house you, by selling tokens for a property that they want to buy and not having to go to a bank for a mortgage. Those are the kinds of things that we think are possible on Bitcoin Cash and create what is a service economy around the world where you get something partially by tokenizing it. And that, I think, is a powerful dream for the world. I'll finish by mentioning what we do at Enchain Group so you understand our perspective. We drive everything we do to see this day of Bitcoin Cash as the dominant blockchain. We have a research and development business unit in the United Kingdom. We have an IP holding company with the largest blockchain IP portfolio we believe in the world. We have an investment arm where we invest in Bitcoin Cash products and applications. We have a consumer-facing business in Canada which runs a Bitcoin wallet and exchange. And finally, we're also in mining we have mining operations which mine Bitcoin Cash. Uh, it's a powerful world for blockchain, one that I firmly believe is ripe for Africa to embrace and use to transform yourself into things such as that on-demand or as-a-service economy for changing how you own, use, and leverage goods and services around the continent, around the world. So I hope you share this dream with me of Bitcoin Cash for Africa and the world, and I'll be more than happy to talk with you about it as the rest of the day goes on. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll go straight into this discussion. Again, we're discussing the future use of blockchain uh, in Africa, and we're really going to talk about the players involved in the implementation of uh, blockchain platforms on the continent and future outcomes and how we're going to be using it to solve the problems that we have. Uh, one of the things that we know is that mobile phone penetration is increasing year over year in Africa. Um, and this can be looked at as an opportunity to be leveraged. So how can blockchain be used in conjunction with the Internet of Things to leverage the growth of mobile phone growth across the continent? La réponse, moi, je voudrais revenir. J'ai vu beaucoup de questions. J'étais là tout à l'heure dans la conférence qui était avant celle-ci. Et si on est venu aujourd'hui, c'est pour apporter quelques réponses concrètes à cette construction autour de la blockchain. La compréhension de la blockchain aujourd'hui, moi je suis tout à fait d'accord que c'est quelque chose qui va changer la manière avec laquelle on va travailler ensemble. Parce que c'est d'abord une machine qui va créer de la confiance. 
et une machine qui est basée sur euh, euh, le travail en commun. Aujourd'hui, faire cette transformation, il faut d'abord maîtriser la technologie. Et maîtriser cette technologie, c'est commencer à la produire et à la mettre en place entre différentes régions. Nous, notre proposition, moi je, je suis derrière beaucoup de start-up, mais comment on a pu réussir et adopter les technologies, du moins dans notre région, en Afrique C'est qu'on a commencé à faire des tests. Ce matin, on a signé entre deux postes, la poste tunisienne et la poste du Mali. Pourquoi Pour tester la traçabilité des données entre ces deux postes-là. Et si ce projet donne un résultat, il pourra être dupliqué. Donc la réponse qu'on veut apporter aujourd'hui, c'est de commencer à faire des use cases, des, des, des tests, à mettre en place des gens qui travaillent ensemble, à prouver et à créer cette confiance qui se fait autour de la blockchain pour montrer des réponses. Donc c'est comme ça qu'on voit la transformation qui devrait euh, venir à travers la blockchain. Thank you very much, Karim. That's uh, a very good point. Uh, I'm glad you told us about that agreement. Uh, it's really nice to see that things are, are happening even as we speak here at this conference. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up with what you said and put my question to you, Sandra. Um, just in, in the same token as, as he's uh, speaking is, as an experienced professional in the fintech industry, um, how can blockchain make an immediate impact here in Africa on the way business is done? And you have to consider the existing challenges. So how do we ad address those challenges, seeing that we want to improve the way business is done? Sure. Uh, so for those of you who are um, just walked in the room, I mentioned I wear two different hats, one for a nonprofit that's focusing on education and blockchain, and the other one is an actual startup working on projects in Africa. And so when I think about some of the challenges, there's kind of two levels of thinking. Um, there are probably more, but I'm going to just distill it down to two. So if you're a big corporation or you're a government, you have existing systems. And your point of view is probably coming from, can blockchain actually improve efficiencies in my processes? Or can it help me to do something to reduce costs? It's not necessarily an, a growth opportunity. Um, and think if you're a startup or an entrepreneur, you're thinking about it more from a, uh, where can I go to make lots of money and or solve also a social problem or a real world problem? And what we need is actually both. We need a combination of um, entrepreneurs who are willing to kind of create the leading edge uh, companies and use cases. And then we need also the governments and big enterprises to also invest, uh, create the ecosystems that will allow us to actually flourish. And I think I've heard this again and again, and I guess this is the inaugural blockchain um, session for uh, Smart Africa. Um, the talent pool, the education needs to um, grow here, and I think there's a real desire to have that happen. I also think there needs to be significant investment in the next generation of developers and business people to make that happen. Great. Um, on that note, uh, when we talk about getting young people involved and getting address this question to you, Michael, because you're involved in this space and it's really interesting what you're doing. Um, so should social entrepreneurs be paying attention to blockchain or cryptocurrencies as a way to access finance? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, from Nairobi, one of the things we're noticing is some of the young people are looking at, uh, at uh, the token, the token models that have come up as a way to raise capital. Uh, I think there's been a certain discrimination in, in Kenya, for example, where there are a lot of opportunities and we have a lot of foreigners who are coming to fail to exploit these opportunities. And there was a report by, the, by Village Capital and uh, EAVCA that said 90% of the venture capital that is coming into, into our country, that's Kenya, is going into foreign-owned startups. 
So uh, I think there's, uh, the VC funding model is kind of skewed. And what I see blockchain, uh, the open blockchain movement, what's doing, it's opening up capital from all over the world to find projects that individuals may be interested in. If you look at uh, the current VC models, they're limited to what are called accredited investors, where you kind of need to have uh, at least, I think it's $2 million before you can invest in a company. And the token models that have come up right now are making it possible for anyone from Pakistan to Australia to spot an opportunity in Kenya, uh, where there might be a social entrepreneur who has a great interesting project. And, and all of a sudden, this person can tap into the, that kind of capital. Uh, our company as, as well, as Chama Pesa, has also been made possible by this new token model because we are using the token model on the blockchain to, to raise capital from our project. Previously, we had a hard time convincing uh, venture capitalists to fund our project because it wasn't in line with what they thought was appropriate. Uh, in Kenya, there's been this boom in uh, in lending models, in fintechs that are lending. And we, we, are, we are coming from as a, as a blockchain project. We are seeing that perhaps lending may not be the best way to lift uh, Africa out of poverty. The best way might be to encourage people to save. And, and the venture capitalists completely disagree with this. So now all of a sudden, we, we don't need to go pitch uh, a venture capital, we, capitalist. We can, we can pitch our product and our service to to anyone else in the world. I think the other way that I've seen, an interesting model that I've seen from Nairobi, where there's this company called, uh, uh, it's called 4G Capital, and what they did, they created this, uh, what's called a crypto bond. And their work, then the business of lending to small businesses and small entrepreneurs. Uh, and one of the th biggest problems in Nairobi and in Kenya is the banks generally don't lend to small businesses because small businesses don't keep their records on, it's hard to, they don't keep their records on digital platforms in a way that the banks would appreciate, that the banks would find uh, their records to have integrity. And what this company has done, it's, it's tapped into the cryptocurrency market by creating a bond that can be funded by the cryptocurrency market. And then these bonds, uh, this cryptocurrency can be converted into USD and come back into the country as a, uh, as, as loans at a lower interest rate for small entrepreneurs in, 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 in Kenya. So I, I do believe that, uh, that uh, the blockchain has made these new funding models possible for all sorts of businesses. Yeah. Uh, one last thing is uh, I met an entrepreneur from South Africa who's, who's building a platform that would allow startups to, to pitch their ideas on a platform where investors could, could put money into this project. So you can see that the earliest entrepreneurs are thinking about how can we tap into this cryptocurrency to fund some of the businesses that might get overlooked in, in, in Kenya, for example. And, 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 and I believe this applies to the rest of East Africa as well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, speaking of entrepreneurship, this question is for you, Jimmy. Uh, how do you see blockchain or even the work that you're doing with the chain uh, with cryptocurrencies how do you see that as a tool to facilitate uh, intra-african trade and uh, what will it take for the public and private sectors to really buy in so we at Enchain believe part of the true power of blockchain particularly on bitcoin cash is the ability to create new forms of trading uh, right now, people think of cryptocurrency as a particular coin, but as I mentioned during my opening presentation, uh, you can now start tokenizing any type of asset on Bitcoin Cash once opcodes are restored and a variety of groups, including our company, are coming up with tokenizing solutions. So that means uh, when you do that, it just means taking some other asset and representing it as a token, which can then get recorded on blockchain, on Bitcoin Cash, can then get bought and sold and traded and swapped for other uh, types of assets. So for example, you could tokenize um, uh, common stock right, in, in a company. You could tokenize a bond. You could tokenize your car by identifying it with, let's say, a vehicle identification number. Uh, and then once you do that, 
and then you can trade between those forms of assets because you can compare their value, let's say, relative to Bitcoin Cash's value on a given day and um, a particular fiat currency, like the Rwandan franc or the you know, British um, pound. And so it provides a way to um, trade things around the world more efficiently, record on a blockchain and have the title of ownership transfer between people. I want to trade you, let's say, my five stock in Apple right, that I have because I want to get your 10 Google stock instead of having to sell it for a particular currency first and then buy the Google stock with my new currency, you can do um, particular trades. And our chief scientist, Craig Wright, is going to be speaking about that over the next few weeks at various conferences. So that's how I think blockchain can change trading. And for a continent like Africa, I think that's really fascinating because you can tokenize physical things, right, um, agricultural items, food items. Uh, stock, um, futures contracts, right? A whole new world of trading, which I think you should all think about. Thank you. Um, and now we're just going to change the pace a little bit here. And um, I want to talk about one of the things that has been mentioned a lot uh, during this conference and previous conferences. Um, and when we talk about smart Africa, uh, we get into smart cities, uh, smart grids, this kind of thing. So this question is for you, uh, Riyadh. Um, since we've heard a lot about smart cities recently, uh, how does blockchain fit into this conversation? Is there an opportunity to bring smart grids, for example, that use uh, blockchain to manage the supply and demand of electricity in a tra transparent and efficient manner? Thank you. Yeah, before getting to that question, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned, uh, I think, this company, 4G Capital in Kenya. Why? It's because I'm on the advisory board of a startup in Vancouver doing blockchain stuff called FinHaven, and I think one of their first customers or partners is 4G Capital in Kenya. So if there was, like, you know, any, any uh, like, you know, way to show that there is a market in Africa, I mean, that's basically the best example, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, let me get back to this one. Uh, smart city, yeah, I mean, I... I I see blockchain differently depends on where in the world, right? Uh, startups and ideas in blockchain, I mean, we see them all the time in my accelerator and a few other things. Uh, I see at least two, three, you know, startups a day on blockchain. Uh, three categories, like guys doing like fundamental blockchain platforms, sort of like, okay, replacing the internet type stuff in a P2P and all of that. Uh, more tools to make the platforms work, identity, authentication, all of that. And then above it, application, which is across the board, right? So, but those startups in um, sophisticated ecosystems, I mean, they, they run the way they should run, they raise money, they take time, and they try to basically scale and grow, right? If I take the whole thing into uh, Algiers, for example, uh, you know, that, that's not possible. You can't like, just hop like, to have an idea and, and build a startup and, you know, and raise money and take time and, and grow, right? So we've taken a totally different approach. So we see smart city more as, uh, as a means to an end than an end in itself, right? Uh, smart city can be defined the way you want by whoever you want, but I think for us we see it is uh, is a means to an end. Um, you know, and, and and what that does mean? I mean, we looked at the whole smart city. We identified three fundamental problems in Algiers, and I think they're common to lots of the world as well. Uh, we, we have an isolation versus like you know the rest of uh, the technology hubs in the world. We have a dependency vis-a-vis -vis technologies, and we have a lack of confidence in the ecosystem to build things, right? So we have this IDC theory, isolation, dependency, and confidence. So when we take those problems, okay, how do we solve them? Or at least how we try solving them? And uh, one fundamental thing is say, okay, we're going to approach it by looking at leapfrog technologies, right? Leapfrog technologies are the ones that are fairly new for everybody. Blockchain is with us for the last 10 years or so, you know, maybe like more the last three, four years. But it's still very new, right? So if you start working with it, I mean, you're basically on par with the rest of the world. It's mostly open source, so accessible. If you have talent, you can grab it and work on it. So we go with leapfrog technologies, and there are others, not only blockchain, same in AI, unlicensed wireless, things like that, right? Then we go with, okay, let's try to take these technologies and solve problems in the city. And, you know, can imagine any problem you want in the city, right? But then, the way we do it is by going demand-driven. I mean, the way we approach the startup and in a smart city is we make sure there is demand, which is basically revenue or customers for the startups, and then we go and do the startup. So what, the way we have been approaching blockchain, say, okay, uh, let's, let's figure out what are the problems here uh, from a demand side, from the energy companies, transport companies, water companies, whatever. And then we go bottom-up, 
basically we don't say, okay, let's start crowdsource for ideas at the same time, train at the same time. But at the end of the day, what we've been doing is forming a triangle uh, demand, which is mostly industry and, and government and all of that, uh, startups, teams, and blockchain, and three like policy makers, regulators, and all of that, right? So we put the whole ecosystem of having this triangle and try to figure out how we build solutions around blockchain that uh, can be adopted very quickly and adopted by having the triangle all adopted, right? We've put multiple things to make that happen. Just one example, as far as regulators and, and policy makers, we say, okay, I mean, uh, it, it's hard to, to basically say something is good, that hence we should do it unless we see it. So we created what we call an open sky experimental lab that's sort of a free zone for testing things without regulations, right? And we bring in the solutions, we test them, and the relaxed regulations, we show the results, and it allows the regulator to move much faster in, in basically making the regulation work. So we do that in the blockchain context as well. So at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, we're looking at all these problems like, you know, peer-to-peer -peer energy and, and water management. And see, blockchain at the end of the day, you know, anytime you have some form of contracts and some form of hyperledger and data storage, you can figure out a way of doing it with blockchain. Does it make sense? Yes, no? That's a different story. But uh, we've taken a very uh, pragmatic uh, demand-driven approach we find the customers, we have them agree that this is a problem that's not solved today or not solved the right way, and then we force basically uh, a, a, a bottom-up, like, you know, basically blockchain startup creation, blockchain teams creation, you know, training them, and more importantly, for this isolation story, uh, we've taken the approach of saying these teams, we link them to some of the top guys or, uh, you know, in, in this space, to basically become a virtual global team. We want to get away from saying, what well, you know, we're doing this special region. It has to be more, I mean, that's the whole thing with open source, right? In one place. And that's what I think is the opportunity for, uh, for us, for Chanel Algiers, but for the whole Africa, and maybe the whole world as well. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just to follow up on what you're saying, and this question is to anybody on the panel. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the potential of blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies and how it can fit into the development agenda of, of, of Africa in general. Uh, but on this panel, we want to talk more about um, the tangible things, the tangible things, the steps that need to be taken to implement these things. So my question, and again, this is for anybody here, um, can we talk a little bit about the type of partners we need to engage to implement um, and what they need to bring to the table to support this, this implementation and engagement? So. First of all, I want to thank you very much for bringing that up because I'm a pragmatist. I believe in building things, and so as much as I love talking about blockchain, um, I feel like you know we need to get in our hands dirty and actually start building and building companies here. So I want to talk about one project in particular that we're launching in Mauritius, and the ingredients that you need. So the use case is very simple opening up R&D and tracking processes around indigenous seeds and plants. So every country probably has a set of unique um, flora that belong to that region or that country. Oftentimes what happens is it gets picked up or used or genetically modified ever so slightly with a worldwide patent put on it by some big corporation. And if there is a blockbuster drug or cosmetic product, it's very unlikely that the farmer and or the scientists and or the government uh, from which those plants or originate actually benefit financially, economically. So what if in a world you could build a transparent global R&D system that will allow you to track um, not only the plants themselves and the classification of them and identification, but also the licensing and the R&D development of that into a wellness product or a skincare product or a medicinal product. So we're working on that under a, um, a legal framework that's being worked on um, by an organization we I cannot say yet, but it's a, it's a global organization, creating that legal framework to then build smart contracts into a blockchain solution. And why is this significant? Because in Mauritius there are about 10 to 20 commercially significant plants that have been identified amongst the hundreds that they have. And if any single one of them were to become commercially viable, why not, why shouldn't a scientist and the university and the government and the farmers and anyone who touched that R&D process actually benefit from any economic uh, profits from that? And so this is around fairness, it's around transparency, um, it's happening, you know, the, the launch dates are imminent and we're looking at scaling that out, 
you'd be surprised how many islands around the world have contacted us or were in discussions with who also want to document their seeds and their plants. Um, this is big money. It's just overlooked. And these are assets that countries have. It's pretty um, easy to do once you've put in the system and have the will to do it. But what do you need? You need government. You need the tech. You need people on the ground who are willing, the scientists who are willing to identify and, and help you to verify these things. And also the desire of um, a commercial element to be built in as well as a legal framework. So there are a number of pieces that you need, but once you build that, you can actually scale that out pretty quickly. Okay, and great insights by the way. Any panelists want to add to that? I would like to give approach Comment on voit les choses sur le, terrain, sur le terrain réellement Quand il y a une technologie pareille, on voit à peu près, on regarde la manière qui va nous aider à transformer notre manière de travailler ensemble. Nous, en Tunisie, on a vu plusieurs cas. On a des métiers dans lesquels nos médecins et le secteur de la santé fonctionnent parfaitement. Beaucoup de nos confrères africains viennent se faire soigner en Tunisie. On a à peu près 200 cliniques privées. En revanche, on a trouvé qu'il y avait un problème. Le problème, c'est le dossier médical partagé avec une maîtrise de la, de, de la privacy, de, des données. Alors là, quand on voit qu'on a une solution et que la technologie va nous apporter une valeur, on combine. Et c'est dans ce cadre qu'on est là aujourd'hui aussi en train d'étudier comment on peut travailler pour monter un, une sorte de blockchain dans la santé où la maîtrise du dossier médical sera faite par le patient et quand il se déplacera, pas seulement en Tunisie, hein, ça peut être en Afrique du Sud, ça peut être en Algérie, ça dépend des spécialités qu'on aura dans notre euh, continent pour partager l'expérience, mais le dossier médical sera la propriété du patient. Ça, c'est quelque chose sur laquelle nous, on va investir parce que on a le métier, on a des cliniques, on a des médecins et c'est une expérience qu'on pourra partager avec le premier pays africain qui voudrait bien travailler avec nous en Tunisie. Voilà un use case qui est tout de suite, qu'on pourra mettre tout de suite sur la table. That's actually a very great input. Um, do you want to add? A... Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that uh, I think where I've seen there's, uh, we need to do more partnerships is in uh, capacity building. Uh, a lot of the young entrepreneurs I meet in Nairobi, they have uh, these exciting ideas about what they'd like to build and how they'd like to incorporate blockchain technology and they always the problem always comes in when they really when they want to build this there's really no one to build these things you see we have a lot of young developers in Nairobi but they don't have this uh, this new skill of uh, of building out blockchain applications or interacting with blockchain technology and if you look at the rest of the world there's there's no blockchain developer uh, seven seven years ago. This is a very new phenomenon. The, the technology is very new. There's no one who can claim to be an expert in this. And I think this this is a huge opportunity for for us to to build capacity within our own young people. Our own young people should be able. It's, this is an opportunity for them to learn this technology and learn how to build. And what I've noticed is some of a lot of the companies in Nairobi they're having to export talent. You know. Uh, there's this company in Nairobi called Bitpesa, and when they were building their first application, they actually hired a consulting team from Germany. Yeah, so so it's very unfortunate that this is a very new technology where no one has expert, no one had expertise before. Yet we seem to be going in a direction where we have to find we have to find foreigners to come and help us build these things. So the kind of partnerships I'd like to see are partnerships between. Uh, maybe local hubs in, within the continent, maybe universities and uh, education centers with the development community 
abroad. You know, the people who are building the, the current block, blockchains right now, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's EOS, whether it's uh, Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin, how, how can we get those people together so that we can have this, uh, this knowledge uh, transfer? And uh, we've been trying to do that in Nairobi. Uh, we're trying to get together developers for a hackathon and just invite any kind of developer from any blockchain project in the world. So I think capacity building through partnership partnerships with uh, the development community that's building out this uh, this new infrastructure yeah okay thanks for that um, before I ask the next panelist uh, we're also gonna have some time to ask to get the audience their input uh, into this conversation we're having but before we get to that I want to know uh, Riyadh your thoughts and then Jimmy so if we can quickly go through it and then get the audience involved thoughts on uh, the same question yeah yeah Okay, très bien. Um, sure, sure. Um, blockchain, en fait, de manière générale, il y a, il y a deux types de, 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 de compagnies, soit start-up ou autre. Hein. C'est ceux qui approchent le blockchain au niveau fondamental, c'est-à-dire uh, développer des plateformes technologiques, genre évolution Internet, évolution routage et tout ça. Donc c'est fondamentalement du risque technologique. Hein. Uh, et la deuxième catégorie, c'est plus des, des, des boîtes, des start-up qui sont sur uh, de l'applicatif où ils prennent la plateforme, ils font des choses au-dessus. Et, et ça, je le vois plus comme un risque euh, business, risque scale, risque euh, marketing, mais moins sur le risque technologique. Euh, si je vois Alger, par exemple, une grande partie des, des, you know, des, des pays émergents, en fait, hein, euh, c'est plus la seconde catégorie. Et euh, donc, très vite, donc, on dit la deuxième catégorie de, de boîtes en blockchain, très vite, on se dit, OK, comment on les fait réussir La question principale, et ça s'applique à différents types de startups, pas juste les startups blockchain. Hein, et euh, la solution qu'on a prise là, c'est plus... Euh, c'est plus euh, accélérer l'aspect demande, l'aspect client, l'aspect revenu. Parce que l'aspect capital va, va être problématique, I mean, sur le moyen terme au moins, hein, sur différents pays. Donc c'est l'aspect plus euh, comment accélérer l'aspect demande. Et dans le contexte de blockchain, on trouve en fait euh, la, la solution. Ce qu'on voit aussi, c'est euh, euh, l'adoption et l'aspect influencer les, les régulateurs de manière à accélérer le matchmaking entre le supply and demand au niveau des technologies. Quoi. Donc, donc, il faut voir vraiment les, les aspects startup blockchain comme euh, d'abord c'est une startup, ensuite c'est du blockchain. Et, euh, et, et faire, faire réussir les startups, dans, dans, par exemple à Alger, euh, ça ne va pas se faire naturellement. I mean, il faut les aider avec l'aspect demande parce que l'aspect capital va être problématique. Donc voilà. Et je pense que sur le blockchain, c'est la même chose, mais juste l'aspect nouveau, l'aspect régulation, l'aspect policy making, et ça va contribuer à, à améliorer le matchmaking demande et, et supply. Donc, voilà. Merci. Jimmy Sure. Um, in my view, uh, partnerships need to happen in three key areas. One, as you've heard about, is education for developers in particular and people who want to work in blockchain. There's a huge shortage of developers in the world who know about blockchain at all. And for us, uh, the Bitcoin Cash Chain, and that's why we are doing things such as supporting uh, next generation city blockchain development programs. We're doing one right now with a company called Stack Lab in the Philippines, not in Manila. top tier developers, at least 50, will go through a six month training program to learn Bitcoin Cash development. Um, we're doing that to fuel what we hope to be a next generation tech hub there and then trying that in other cities across the Philippines, which is a great place for development. I think something like that needs to happen here in Africa and other territories. It could be done with universities, private training programs. We at Enchain are also doing something similar with an engineering school in Paris to help train the next generation of Bitcoin developers. Secondly, I think um, we need partnerships and more people running exchanges. Cryptocurrency of any type is very difficult to get here in Africa. I believe there are only three countries that have uh, online exchanges operating here. So we've been approached about whether we can provide technological support to create back-end systems to enable more people who want to operate exchanges here to give people access to Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Um, I think that's important. It'll all probably also take some government regulatory, if not approval and licensing, at least uh, recognition that they can operate for a while and, and leave them alone. And finally, I think that people forget another partnership that this community needs, legacy businesses. A lot of people that's going to disrupt existing industries and therefore existing industries are afraid of it, don't want to deal with it. The reality is they are, and if you're thinking of a blockchain venture, um, you're going to be solving a problem ideally, 
that can be improved with blockchain technology. And that often can be best done by working with partners who are the big legacy businesses because they can help identify the problem and how your venture can help solve it. It can provide you a platform for usage and customers and funding. Um, it's one approach we've taken at Enchain because we're so much of a research and development think tank. So one of our first major business partnerships is with the SBI group in Japan, a major financial services conglomerate that spun off years ago from SoftBank. They're launching a crypto exchange. They wanted security innovations to make crypto safer to buy and hold for their customers. We have security innovations and we have a partnership with them to help implement and design what we think is the next generation world's safest secure wallet system. But that took us willing to work with what was perceived as a legacy business, even though they're very much in internet financial services. And we've been approached by others in other industries. And so I encourage you not to be afraid uh, or feel that legacy businesses don't have a place in the blockchain world. They absolutely do, and I think they are a great place for you all to form partnerships. That's a very good point. Uh, it actually connects to what Karim was talking about in bringing privacy uh, to people who want to have their medical records when they travel abroad for health care. Um, so on that note, I think one of the takeaways from this is that education and um, uh, just a buildup of knowledge, uh, a critical mass of knowledge about the potential of, of blockchain is required. It is, there's a requirement to engage government. There's a requirement to engage researchers and scientists. And there's also a, re a requirement to engage uh, business and industry uh, and create an ecosystem where we get things moving. So on that note, I want to turn it to the audience. Uh, does anyone have a question for our panelists? We've got one here in the front, and then we'll take one there in the back. If we can get a microphone up here. So we'll take three questions, and then uh, once we take all the questions, we'll answer them, and then if we have time, we'll take a couple more. So. How can you in good conscience say that by sequencing DNA and putting them on the blockchain, you're adding value? I mean, everyone loves to lambast patents and whatever else, but seeing as you cannot actually patent a DNA, and I'll say that as a person with an LLM in that area, you can't. You can patent sequencing technology. You can patent how to do it. You can patent what you do to detect it. You can, de you can patent detection things. How can you say, by doing this and getting people to spend a lot of money that suddenly they're going to have value when they don't. There's no new technology for actually finding these things created. That simple. How do you do Sorry that in good conscience? There. Was there a question? How do you do that in good conscience? How do you lie to these people saying that they're going to sequence their information, make value, when that is just false? All right. I, I, I'm not sure if anyone wants to take that. To me, it sounds like a I comment. Will. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jimmy. Now we're late. Um, sure. The, the, just hang on a second. We'll, 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 we'll get to that after. We're going to take two more questions. But I will come back to you for the answer for that. Yes, please. OK, thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Mark Tarsek. I'm working at uh, United If you can please stand up. I'm working at United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And uh, we did a lot in blockchain in Africa. Let me shift now to French because we have, uh, I have some uh, issue concerning Tunisia and uh, Algeria. Bon, je pense que votre session est très importante et intéressante pour uh, les, les différents participants. Parce que je pense qu'actuellement, on est d'accord que la technologie blockchain contribue à l'efficacité au niveau de plusieurs secteurs. On a vu beaucoup d'avantages dans tous les secteurs de la vie. Donc on a vu en, en, en Tunisie avec le IDINAR, qui, a, qui, qui était le premier pays au monde à mettre sa monnaie locale au niveau de, de, de la blockchain. Il y a des applications aussi, je pense qu'il y a des gens de, du Ghana, le Bitland qui utilise euh, la, la transformation cadastrale par le, bit, par le blockchain. Et aussi beaucoup d'ex, beaucoup d'applications aussi au Kenya, en Afrique du Sud, où il y a six banques 
actuellement les plus grandes banques qui utilisent blockchain. Mais le problème principal que je n'ai pas entendu ici, hein, c'est comment il faut faire pour que l'Afrique puisse en bénéficier. Et il y a déjà un fondamental qu'il faut résoudre. C'est le problème de l'énergie. Parce que le blockchain est herbivore en électricité. Je vous donne un exemple. Par exemple, en Afrique, Des pays comme le Libéria sont à 2%. Et si pour le minage de la, de, du, but, du bitcoin, par exemple au Soudan, la consommation annuelle est de 10 terabits par an. Et pour le minage de, de la blockchain, il faut 30 terabits. Donc il y a plus de 200% ou bien 300% de leur consommation. Donc ça pose un problème au niveau de l'Afrique. Le, le deuxième problème, c'est au niveau des infrastructures. Sachant que nous avons un accès au mobile broadband qui est inférieur à 20% et le fixe broadband est inférieur à 2%. Donc c'est des... Et aussi, il y a quelqu'un qui l'a qui, qui souligné tout à l'heure, les questions de capacité building. Je pense que c'est des choses sur lesquelles il faudra s'apesantir. Et le plus important aussi, il y a la régulation. Comment faire évoluer ces nouveaux, ces nouveaux players qui sont venus, les start-up, le monde des finances et le secteur des télécoms c'est des choses extrêmement importantes sur lesquelles je pense que le panel doit pouvoir mettre l'accent pour donner peut-être des idées, des perspectives. Mais je pense qu'une question fondamentale est l'électricité. Et il n'y a pas de hasard qu'au niveau du monde, c'est dans la Chine qu'on rentre compte plusieurs start-up en blockchain. La raison est que le coût de l'électricité est très bas et l'accès est élevé. Je vous remercie. Is there another question? Okay, we'll just take those two questions for now. Uh, Jimmy, you want to take the first one? Well, I get the privilege of working with Dr. Wright on a daily basis, and I can tell you he has some very strong opinions, and I think that not to directly answer his question, but to, I think, explain the point of his question, is that a lot of people are creating tokens and quote blockchain projects, what they're calling blockchain projects today, which really aren't necessary. Um, it's caused by this wave of ICOs and tokens you've seen. There's now over a thousand coins out there, right? And everyone's got a coin. I mean, by the time I leave, I'll have a Jimmy coin, you know, here. Um, and people are doing it because, frankly, they're just trying to come up with an idea, most of them, just to make quick money. Nothing wrong with that. But why Dr. Wright's asking, can you in good conscience do something by creating a project that's just going to record to a ledger, which is what a blockchain is, data that already exists, and doesn't create any new utility, new function with your token. That's not a good use of your time, energy, and more importantly, people's investment money who might buy your token. So what we believe is that tokens have a place and a purpose. But we would encourage people not to create a token just to record data in it that already exists somewhere that you're not adding new functionality to. So the example I gave in my presentation about tokenizing assets and then being able to trade them or do something different, for example, changing how you own property in Africa or own a car because it makes it easier for people to afford partial interest in something and they don't have to save as much money for a full car or full house. That's a unique added functionality for a token, which is more powerful than just trying to launch a project that records existing data with no new function. That is what we're asking you to think about. And we think that could all be done to quickly answer the second question on Bitcoin Cash, which you don't have to mine, let other people mine it and do your token and operate on a public blockchain that you don't have to run yourself and have mining yourself as opposed to creating your own private or new blockchain where you have to mine. Use the public blockchain that's out there, and it'll be powerful enough for the whole world. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on uh, on the gentleman's question from the UN. Uh, so, sorry, Michael, just before we go on, I, I'm not sure. Riyadh, did you have something to add to to that? No, no okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's necessary for all of us to mine. The whole point of, uh, of Bitcoin is it's... And, Bitcoin-like systems is that they are accessible to everyone. You you don't need to personally r run a, a mining center for you to confirm that, for example, your transaction has gone through or if your funds are still available because the blockchain is a public ledger. And uh, I think it's natural that the mining centers, they are, 
naturally going to end up in the places where it's most efficient to mine. This could be areas like Iceland or some of the colder parts of, uh, of, uh, of China, and, and there's, there's really nothing wrong with this. Uh, the other point I'd like to add regarding that is there's also a movement where uh, running blockchains is moving away from, uh, from, uh, from proof of work, which is the mining intensive uh, process of, of supporting the, the Bitcoin blockchain to other consensus methods that do not necessarily require mining. And, and, and I'll, I'll give an example of one blockchain known as uh, the EOS blockchain, which instead of using mining, it uses data centers. It uses data centers for storage. And in fact, the money that would have been used, would have been burnt up as electricity, is instead used to fund projects that are built on, uh, on this blockchain project. And one example of how that has made it possible for, for Africans to participate is in Nairobi, where uh, the EOS blockchain is looking for what are called 21 block producers, people who support this blockchain. And these are candidates in Nairobi. They are a group of young people who have got together in Nairobi, and they are bidding. They are making a bid to be one of the people to host one of these 21 or the 100 supporting uh, data centers. And this, this is not something that requires electricity. This is something that just requires uh, an internet connection, uh, a strong internet connection, and, and a data center. And, and those young people in Nairobi are working with Liquid Telecom. So uh, you kind of have to move away from just thinking about uh, blockchains being um, about mining only. There are other consensus methods that don't depend on that. Uh, regarding your second question on, uh, on where, how can Africa tap into, into this cryptocurrency technology and blockchain technology. Uh, personally, where I've seen one of the places where we could benefit the most is in uh, connecting Africa to, to the rest of the world or connecting Africa to, to, to the virtual world. Because sometimes we forget that uh, we are living in an economy where we both have the physical, geographical areas and we also have the virtual internet economy. And Africa has really suffered because we we have sort of become accustomed to using uh, uh, the U.S. dollar. You know, we've we we have built systems that are so dependent on on the U.S. dollar, which is unfortunately it is someone else's currency. Yeah, and what that has done is it has burdened us with some of the rules that come with using someone else's currency. I'll give you a practical example from Nairobi, where. Actually, this is a problem not just in Nairobi. It's a problem in East Africa, where a lot of young people are now looking for opportunities online. And up to the point where they, they, they get paid, everything goes smoothly. But as soon as they want to get paid in virtual US dollars, that's when problems start emerging. Because there are a lot of rules surrounding how the US dollar can be used in various countries. You, ca you can't transfer more than $10,000. If you need to transfer $2,000, you need to provide a lot of in identity information. Your funds can be frozen. And these are some of the rules that burden us because it becomes really difficult for these young people to get paid. A lot of them have, they have their funds frozen because they can't provide a street address for, for where they live. Now, if you've ever lived in Africa, you know we don't have we don't have a, we don't have street addresses. So, when I look at cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, I see uh, I see a new internet currency uh, or an asset or whatever, but just a means of value exchange between borders, between geographical borders and between virtual and geographical borders that do not come with any rules. So this is like this is a, a, a value transfer mechanism that is just neutral. It doesn't tell you these are the rules you need to, to, to abide by to use this. It doesn't ask you for identity information. And, and I see that as a great opportunity for Africa because it's giving us a clean slate. We, we, we can decide to, to build identity rules for how to access money from abroad based on what works for us. We, we, we no longer have to, to look up to the United States and ask them, we don't have to look up to the United States to tell us if you're going to access $5,000 from PayPal, you need to give us X, Y, Z information, and we don't care if you have this kind of information. And if you go, if, if you go a step further across that vertical, you will find that these are the same systems that we use for moving uh, money through the corresponding banking system. If, if it's farmers who have to get paid uh, in, in, the, in the billions for 
for tea, for coffee, for some of the commodities coming out of, uh, of Africa. This man is usually have to move through three or four banks in Europe just to get here. By the time they get here, about 7% of that is gone in just fees. You can see this problem is, is common across remittances, it's common across cross-border payment systems. I mean, why should I be moving money through? If I want to send money to Nigeria, that money has to go through Citibank, go through some city banks and some U.S. banks before going to Nigeria. I, I don't know about you, but I find that a, a bit ridiculous. So I think we should look at this currency and value exchange mechanism as, as a new opportunity to build new kinds of financial, financial rails for moving money. And this is what is going to support trade. It's going to support young people connecting online. It's going to support the free flow of capital into and out of, of Africa. So that's, that's what I think. So just to, just to echo what he's just said, I think what's really unique about this community is that we have um, basically open access, meaning if you have the desire to learn, come and join. Uh, I started off going to fairly dodgy pubs in London uh, learning about Bitcoin back in 2012. Um, obviously, a few people had already learned a lot about it, but when it was actually, even back in 2012, there weren't that many people. You just kind of figured it out by meeting up. There were meetups, and then those meetups grew into uh, very specific silos, and people got into other cryptos, and then that community grew, and then there were development-specific communities. The point being is that this is really a gr grassroots effort. Um, we don't always agree with each other. I think we all want a better world. I think we want to solve for things that actually help some of the things that are really broken in society. Um, but I also believe that we should be respectful of, you know, our and I think I absolutely believe in free speech and that if you don't believe in something or you disagree, that's fine. But um, it's the community aspect of this is gonna help us build stuff together or if we decide to go down the other route and not work together and be respectful, then um, you know we won't have the kind of we won't fulfill the potential that we can fulfill with this technology. Thank you very much, Sandra. Um, so we, I think we've run out of time here. Um, any last points? Any uh, last insights from anyone? Well, moi, je voudrais rebondir sur le problème de l'infrastructure en Afrique, soit électricité ou infrastructure télécom. C'est une réalité. Je pense que dans l'avenir, les investissements vont se faire au niveau des infrastructures, aussi bien électricité ou infrastructure télécom. Mais ce n'est pas un handicap pour ne pas faire rêver les enfants, les nouvelles générations, pour construire une Afrique numérique. Ça ne doit pas être un obstacle. On est là pour montrer l'exemple. Et je vous assure qu'il y a beaucoup d'aberrations en Afrique. Beaucoup. Je vais utiliser une. On est deux. Il y a l'Algérie, il y a la Tunisie. C'est le nord de l'Afrique. Si je vous dis, et cette problématique, je l'ai posée à mon ministre ce matin, en Algérie, il y a un dinar. En Tunisie, on a un dinar. On achète l'électricité, le gaz de l'Algérie. On reçoit 3 millions d'Algériens en Tunisie. Comment les échanges se font eh bien, Sur la frontière tuniso-algérienne, on trouve des gens en train de faire les échanges de monnaie fiduciaire sur toute une route, dans l'aller et dans le retour. Eh bien, il ne faut pas être très intelligent pour voir entre les deux pays si on arrive à créer une crypto-monnaie pour déjà faire en sorte que les États contrôlent l'argent qui circule, parce que les États ne contrôlent pas l'argent qui circule, il circule dans le marché parallèle. Ils ne le voient pas, il n'y a pas de taxes. Donc contrôler tout ça à travers une monnaie, c'est déjà quelque chose. Créer de la valeur autour de tout ça, ça peut vraiment apporter des réponses. Voilà des aberrations où, petit à petit, si on commence à voir, point par point, comment les, cette technologie basée sur la confiance, encore une fois, la, 
La blockchain, moi, je ne la perçois pas comme une technologie. Je l'aperçois comme un moteur à donner plus de confiance entre les transactions qui vont se faire. Et donc, petit à petit, on pourra construire cette Afrique. Et, et l'infrastructure arrivera parce qu'on n'a pas le choix. On va la construire et le numérique est là. On ne peut pas dire non. Voilà. Thank you very much, Karim. Uh, maybe a, a closing statement here from Jimmy. Yeah, I, I think I would just close with a thought that I encourage you all to believe in a borderless world where you have more power and control of your finances and data. That, I believe, is the true power of blockchain technology what the world historically has treated as differences between us in currency, in borders, in what we can trade or not trade. Blockchain technology provides the vehicle to allow that to be all done much easier, faster, and without needing to trust intermediaries in between. That's the power I think can really transform Africa, if we're talking about not just a single digital market for Africa, but a single digital world currency blockchain. We think that'll happen on Bitcoin Cash. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all our panelists. And if we can please give them a round of applause for an excellent discussion.
kujira wajia kulevi tamwe esea rapuri chiku jirango na bagore wa bashe kui wana mulu wabujo ugi kwa na wuhayanga kuko vila gara gara ako ito mi kujana vya bagore vya mbomu la afrika bari inyuma mbukoresha iko na wangu ya njeje na wagabo ibiyelo vika wabiga la gaza ko ngomuri ngomu shakira tibu wako zugue muna jiru zuyumu waka wina tunu mnani vika la gaza ko wabadamu mili ya limu nye na mioli magana wili bachiri mu bachifte ugu chene changwa se bachiri muzila majambele mwugu bachiri muzila majambele kuzako vungu ngo badafite cyangwa sadakoresha internet bagasanga rero ari ikibazo cyangwa sari mbogamizi ikomeye cyane mu bijyanye no guteza imbere aba gore cyangwa se kwibona nabo mu bukungu bushingiye ku bumenyi bagasanga ko kugira ngo ibyo byose bishoboke cyangwa se abakoreho kutagira access ku internet ko byibura kenewe miliyari 20 za madola ya menya America kugira ngo abagore ubwabo bibone muri uburyo bwo koresha internet kadukurike icyo kiganiro mu kanya gato yakatarambiranye cyabana cyo gici live kuri televiziyo y'u Rwanda nyuma y'icyo kiganiro cyuruhari rwa bagore nabo mu ikorana buhanga nyuma yaho turaza no kugukurikana ijambo risoza ku mugaragaro inama ya Transform Africa ibaye ku nshuro iya kane mu gihe cyacu cyo rwanda ugiye kure imukanya gato ya nyuma yakano karuhuko